The last year I've seen tremendous translational research breakthroughs in the nephrology section at Wake Forest Baptist. In my mind, one of the most important findings in uh, nephrology research in, in recent times was discovery of the ApoL1 gene and its role in non-diabetic kidney disease in African-derived populations, African-Americans particularly. ApoL1 is the most impressive gene associated with any common complex human disease. It's amazing the role that it's played in 20 years ago we first postulated that there was a kidney failure gene in certain African-American families that predisposed to more than one type of kidney disease. We noted 20 years ago that there were African-American families that had four and five members on dialysis. One of them would have focal sclerosis. One of them would have HIV infection associated with kidney disease. One had what was thought to be kidney disease due to essential hypertension. And other members with diabetes, lupus, other disorders, all of whom had kidney disease required dialysis therapy, but different diseases. And we noticed this tremendous familial clustering of kidney disease. And we're the first ones to describe that more than 30% of African Americans starting dialysis had other relatives already on dialysis. This was an amazing observation. Uh, it, there are many more members of these families with mild to moderate kidney disease. I'm talking 30% had relatives already receiving dialysis therapies. We postulated back in the early 1990s that there was an overarching kidney failure gene that these families inherited and multiple other second hits that would trigger the development of kidney disease. Well, I've spent 20 years looking for that gene. And in 2010, working with a team of investigators, some at the National Institutes of Health, some at Harvard University, the ApoL1 gene was discovered. And the risk of developing severe kidney disease is increased tenfold in individuals with two risk variants in this gene. What's most striking is that the risk variants in this gene are limited to people of African descent. They're virtually absent in people from Europe, European Americans, and Asians. Uh, this suggested that there was something selecting for the uh, presence of these variants that are now associated with kidney disease, but they must have protected from something. And as part of that breakthrough work in 2010, it was discovered that one copy of that risk variant protected from African sleeping sickness, which is a disease associated with trypanosomal infection, which is transmitted by the tsetse fly. Turns out that if you had one copy of the ApoL1 risk variant, you were protected from certain forms of African sleeping sickness. So people survived waves of infection five or 10,000 years ago in sub-Saharan Africa, and the gene was selected for. However, if you were unlucky and got two risk variants of this gene, one from your mother, one from your father, your risk of severe kidney failure goes up tenfold. This is an amazing finding, and it's very similar to malaria and sickle cell disease. If you have one copy of the sickle cell gene, you're relatively protected from malaria, so that gene was common. But if you got two copies of the sickle cell gene, you developed sickle cell anemia and became very sick, also protecting from a parasitic disease in Africa. So it's an amazing finding. But as I said, this is one of the most striking genetic associations uh, in human disease. Some of the things we've been able to demonstrate in the last year are that African-American donated kidneys for transplantation have long been known to function for shorter periods of time than kidneys donated by non-African-Americans. This finding's never been understood. We were able to show at Wake Forest Baptist Nephrology that African-American deceased donor kidneys that had two copies of that risk variant functioned for significantly shorter periods of time than African-American donated kidneys without two risk variants. So this observation suggests there was nothing about being African-American that led to the loss of kidney function in transplanted kidneys. It's solely due to this genetic variant. In fact, African-American kidney donors who didn't have two risk variants in the ApoL1 gene, those kidneys survive equally well as European-Americans and others who donate kidneys. So an amazing breakthrough where we were able to translate the major genetic identification of ApoL1, which happened only a little over a year ago, and we were fortunate to play a role in that is our now translation into the transplant arena to suggest that certain kidneys that are transplanted and have two risk copies of this gene won't work as well. This has tremendous potential implications. The effect of having two copies of this risk variant were greater than all the standard accepted criteria for things we try and fix and select for in a kidney transplant. So for example, we try and reduce the amount of time a kidney's out of the body called the cold ischemia time. 
we try and improve HLA matching so that the kidneys are close to the HLA type of the recipient. Uh, all these factors were compared, and the APOL1 risk variant was a far stronger predictor of outcome than the conventional risk factors we normally think about. This is led by calls from others in transplant nephrology in the United States that all African-American potential kidney donors should be screened for variation in the APOL1 gene. Number one, we think it's very likely to improve the outcomes in that kidney once it's transplanted, and if the kidney donor doesn't have two copies of that risk variant, the kidneys may function far longer. That would be very good for the recipient. The other important aspect, though, is if you have two risk copies of the APOL1 gene, you may need both of your kidneys later so that you don't develop kidney failure in your lifetime. So this has the potential to benefit kidney donors and the recipients of those kidneys. So that's from the live transplant side. The data that we published was developed from deceased kidney donors. And I think it's very likely that APOL1 genotyping will soon be incorporated into the selection criteria for kidneys selected for transplantation. This basic finding just a couple of years ago is likely to improve kidney function after transplantation in all Americans. The unique capabilities of our nephrology division here at Wake Forest to extend this genetic observation in the transplant arena developed because of, number one, our close interaction with the Wake Forest Solid Organ Transplant Program headed by Dr. Robert Strada. This is one of the 20 most active kidney transplant programs in the United States. And because of the large number of transplants that have been formed here historically, we were able to go back into the archives and get DNA samples from large numbers of African-American donors and track their outcomes in all transplants done at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. This is a unique aspect as other medical centers have not yet been able to replicate these findings. I should say we're eagerly awaiting replication of these findings by other groups, but the ability of us to take an initial observation that we participated in and extend it into the clinical arena derives from our close interaction with the transplant program.